Hi, everyone. I'm Miranda, and today I'm presenting work done with my co-authors, Eric Yoshi and Franzi at the University of Washington. Lori, thank you for reading the title. And a content warning before we begin. This talk will discuss uses of technology for abuse and interpersonal relationships. So please don't hesitate to step out of the room or do whatever is best for you. So maybe some of you have heard of this app called TikTok. TikTok is a social media platform on which users post short videos, including trending dance challenges, but also many other types of content. The app reached 1 billion monthly users in 2021, just four years after it launched. And TikTok users are very young compared to other social media apps, with over 50% being 29 or younger. There are many loosely affiliated subcommunities, which can be very niche, but also exceptionally honest and open. And some of the things that the users honestly and openly discuss on TikTok have serious privacy and security implications. So let's just dive right into an example. I know we all want to see the TikToks. And there's no sound, but I guess you can hear or you can uh, see the caption on the slide, which says, welcome to Toxic TikTok. This doesn't happen anymore, but I got you if he's being sketchy. This will pick up all his calls. And if you hear sh that you don't want to hear, I'm so sorry, BB. So in this TikTok, the creator describes how to secretly listen in on what someone else is doing or saying. Step one is to get access to the target's phone and turn on a feature that was originally described, uh, that automatically picks up incoming calls, which is originally intended as an accessibility feature. Step two, when the attacker wants to listen in, the attacker calls the target's phone, which will automatically pick up, allowing the, target, the attacker to eavesdrop without the target taking any action. And this is an example of what we studied, which we call anti-privacy and anti-security advice. Anti-privacy and anti-security because the techniques often involve violating privacy or breaking device and account security. And advice because the videos are intended as guidance, intended to be widely seen. In this research, we first ask, what information or systems are being targeted in anti-privacy or anti-security advice on TikTok and by whom? How are these attacks being carried out and for what reasons? And second, how do anti-privacy and anti-security advice relate to a broader societal context? So now I'd like to talk about our methods. We used a case study methodology and we selected our research questions and case studies at the same time using an approach called progressive focusing. The aim of progressive focusing is to thoroughly understand the case. If early research questions are not working or if new issues become apparent, the design is changed. So in this way, we considered other contexts like Proctorware and smart homes, but ultimately focused on intimate partners and parent-child relationships. And to collect data, we continually added new search terms as we explored relevant topics and creators, and some example keywords were toxic, relationships, parental controls, and kid tracking. Our final data set had 98 TikToks, 66 were from the intimate partner context, 27 were from the parent-child context, and five were related to both. In sum, these videos accounted for 60 minutes and 14 seconds of content, and though we don't have access to view counts, we do know that these videos were very popular because they got more than 16 million likes in total. Across all of our data, we applied two flavors of thematic analysis to answer our two research questions. First, we used deductive thematic analysis, which is theory-driven, and specifically our theory was a security threat modeling framework to understand the attacker, the assets, the techniques, and the rationales. Second, we applied inductive thematic analysis, which is data-driven, to generate themes from what we observed, and specifically, what was the social context of the videos we collected. And I also want to recognize that our analyses and our interpretations are a result of our particular social and ideological positionings, so other teams would have generated other themes. Also very important for this work are the ethical considerations that we made. First, we study data that is publicly available, which meant that our study was deemed exempt by our institution's IRB. But does this mean that the public that, but the, does the public nature of this data mean that creators would allow or expect their data to be used for research? So to protect creators' privacy, we recreated all content and paraphrased all quotes for this talk as well as in the paper. Our goal is to study the techniques and the motivations but not identify the specific creators. We also acknowledge that we surface complicated social ethics questions. For example, should these techniques that we study be used in consensual or trusting relationships? So while we don't resolve that question here, we hope our research can inform the answer. 
All right, so what do we find? Here is an overview of the actors, motivations, and techniques in our two cases. In the intimate partner context, we have the instigator and the target. The instigator's motivations broadly were to detect cheating, do arbitrary surveillance, or exert control on the target. And we found a total of 24 techniques, including abusing data downloads, checking recently used emojis, and more. In the parent-child context, we have the parent and the child, with the child ranging from early school age to teenagers. And the parent's motivations were broadly to ensure child safety or exert control. In the paper, we also discussed the child perspective, but I'll skip that for this talk. We found seven techniques, including hiding air tags in their children's bags, installing tracking apps, and more. So in the initiative partner context, for instigators who wanted to surveil digital communications, one technique we observed was exploiting data downloads. Data downloads are a feature, a privacy feature, in fact, made common by GDPR's right of access. So for example, you can download a copy of the information you shared with Instagram, including all of the sent messages. In the screenshot showed here, the video suggests entering the instigator's email address in the data download request form so that the instigator is sent a copy of the target's Instagram direct messages. And in this scenario, physical access to the target's device is assumed. The video's first instruction is just go on his Instagram, because in close relationships, the common assumption of one person's perfectly secure device does not hold up. Another technique for surveilling digital communications in the intimate partner context is to use emojis as a side channel. As one TikTok creator said, I have personally used this before to confirm or deny my suspicions, just casually ask for his phone, and find a way to type something on the keyboard. So how does this work? Well, it's often possible to view a keyboard on a smartphone without unlocking it. So the TikTok suggests looking for sexually suggestive emojis like eggplants or peaches to infer whether the target is tar sexting other people if the target doesn't usually send those emojis to the instigator. To show an example from the parent-child context, many parents were interested in surveilling their children's location. One popular technique for younger children was to use air tags, despite Apple condemning the use of air tags for tracking people, by putting air tags like on a bracelet and shown, shown in this screenshot, or hiding air tags in the soles of their children's shoes. For older children, some parents required their, their children to download family surveillance apps like Life360 or Bark, and these apps can track location, but also things like how fast they're driving, what they're texting on their phone, and their social media usage. Thinking about the social context of the advice we observed, we saw that social acceptability norms inform the language that creators use to frame their advice. So in the intimate partner context, the videos had a covert framing. They put fake disclaimers at the beginning to say that these videos are only for informational purposes, but then going into precise detail about how exactly to use this technique. The videos use hashtags like toxic, stalker, or crazy girlfriend, and that's because surveillance and control against another adult is typically seen as socially unacceptable, so creators were self-aware that the techniques could be seen as transgressing social and legal norms. In the parent-child context, however, the videos had an overt framing. The videos were directly giving advice, saying, I highly recommend this if you have a child going to school, and were tagged with mom hacks or parenting because in the parent-child context, parents were open about these techniques being used for child safety, which does align with social and legal norms. Gender was also a notable part of the social context of our data set. Videos in the independent partner context assumed a female audience with a male partner. For example, ladies, the goal is to manipulate the algorithm, basically how men manipulate us, which could speak to the expectation that women do emotional labor in heterosexual relationships. In the parent-child context, videos spoke to moms with children and used hashtags like save our children, mom hack, and moms of TikTok, which could speak to the expectation that women do most of the domestic labor and parenting of children. All right, so coming now to the conclusion of this talk, our work shows that information on how to do surveillance and control is becoming more accessible. TikTok subcommunities are publicly producing advice on privacy and vi security violating techniques that anyone can find, these techniques are accessible to people with little to no technical expertise, and the content is packaged in bite-sized viral video clips. Our work joins a growing community of security and privacy researchers critiquing classic security and privacy assumptions. First, this work calls attention to interpersonal adversaries who might have physical access to their target's devices, and this is a very realistic threat for many people, meaning research and design must think beyond one person, one device. 
And further, the creators we observed had deeply personal motivations for their actions, which means that simple technical solutions won't be enough. These creators were very creative in achieving their goals, so solutions will have to be designed with realistic user behavior in mind. And TikTok is a great place to understand users more deeply, so here are some pros and cons for security and privacy researchers who might consider using TikTok as a data source. One pro is that TikTok users tend to be remarkably open, which leads to more insightful data. Security and privacy research studies often have to contend with social desirability bias. For example, if we had tried to interview people about surveilling controlling their partners or children, our data would not have been as rich as it was. And further, TikTok's users are younger than other social media platforms. On the other hand, there are also challenges to using TikTok data. And first and foremost is that there are many ethical considerations with gathering public data. For example, research must think carefully about how to fairly treat content when creators might not expect that it be used for research. And it is still difficult to collect TikTok data at scale because the research API has not been released yet. Finally, understanding TikTok videos requires understanding the community they come from, including their language and style. In summary, we hope future work considers using TikTok data carefully. Thanks so much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions now.